um, difficult for uh, Warren Gatlin to pull it off. Yeah, yeah, they were great. I really loved that Irish team. He wasn't very happy. <laughs> yeah, I was disappointed with him, no, to be honest. Um, his team were second best throughout the whole game. Of course, they had that, that bit of that threat that we spoke about last week here and, and everybody knew they're dangerous with the ball in hand, the whole Scarlet's type game plan, all that stuff. He should have given more credit. Um, it was quite condescending and um, we don't like to see that in sports. G give out, have a rant about your team or the referee or whatever. Just being smart like that. I was, I was disappointed. I like Warren a lot. Um, but just saying, oh yeah, they were excited and they were exciting and yeah. they played great. Well, uh, his mind games bit him on the ass. That's what happened. It was like everything he did last week came back and bit him on the ass. And it's hard afterwards to go, yeah, okay, made a mistake with that. And it's fine for us saying, oh yeah, we got everything right and they were, you know, the mind games and Gareth Davies talking about a bonus point win. It's fine for us to say that now. If he'd got the bonus point win, we'd be going, whoa. That's some, they some it up. balls to, 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 to go out and say that at the start of the week and back it up. But they didn't and I thought uh, it was very strange that that wasn't really addressed and he didn't play that down a little bit. He actually went the opposite talking, talking his team up. Um, and look, he said at the start of the tournament he, he backed him to win a Grand Slam. Um, so it was a little bit disrespectful at the end of the game, um, afterwards in the press conference. but. Um, yeah, the mind game's kind of backfired a little bit. We'll talk about all the good stuff in a couple of minutes' time, but we did concede a bunch of tries. Um, again, I saw that in the papers this morning. Of the 18 games um, since Andy Farrell's come in, we've conceded three tries in 10 of them. Now, like at the same time, we've also scored three intercept tries and all that, so maybe you take those off because that's the, the type of aggressive defence we have. And it still seems to be a work in progress. You don't want a plus minus situation in, and um, same in soccer. If you if you if you four nil up and you can see two sloppy goals at the end, it takes away the, the it damages the performance a bit. And rugby is the same. You go back to Argentina in November. So many things were right. It was a really really clinical good performance. And then at the end, Argentina get a couple of late scores. You're kind of going, why? This fair goes down. Yeah. And why is it happening again and again and again? It's, it's, it's a team issue and it's a communication issue and it's a dominance issue out on the field where guys need to communicate better. It's not a technical thing where guys are going up miss, missing one-on-one -on -one tackles. I think the emphasis from Andy Farrell's defence is to get off the line and all the modern day defence coaches are trying to do that. But it's spacing is an issue and we're quite narrow and you go back to Argentina at the World Cup where that outer channel we were punished a little bit. So it's just, and it's difficult off phase play. This is probably the key. Off set piece, line out scrum, you're set, you know where you're going, you, everyone's pointed in front of them. But it's when the ball is kicked up the field, down the field, there's lots of multi phases. Someone makes a little bit of a line break. How do you readjust? How do you get that spacing right? And unfortunately, we're still work in progress there and we need to sort this out because Joe Schmidt said it himself after the game, so many good things. And then the negative, you're allowing teams back in with so much possession. I think we were 13-5 down at one stage after about 20 minutes having practically dominated territory yeah, possession. Completely. We turned the ball over a couple of times in their 22. We lost the line out, a crucial line out five yards out. Um, of course, you give credit to the defence sometimes when you force one of these turnovers, but I think there's a couple of them are a little bit sloppy. So it's, it's an issue and it's, it's a worry. How taxing is it on the body, that high line speed that Andy Farrell wants? Is that the reason why we're conceding late in the games, because they're just gassed as a result of this tactic? Um, it's, it's, it's a culmination and a mixture of um, the opposition reacting. You know, when you get a score, you're a bit ahead. Teams throw caution to the wind and sometimes it's hard to defend that. Switching off in your mind a little bit, uh, fatigued a little bit. Um, but it's, it's, for me, defence is all about communication when you're tired, when you're under pressure, and that's the real intrigue of sport, under pressure to having the ability to communicate. That's why we do all the fitness work, the skill sessions under pressure, um, you know, the gym sessions, all that kind of stuff. When you have a bit of pain in your body, can you think, how can you communicate? Who do you talk to next to you? How can you identify what's in front of you? You know, when you're running across the field, have you the ability to turn your head and look at what's happening here? Are the guys staying back or are they going to come back this side? Yeah. Do I number up? Who's my man? 
So look, it's not a major, major issue, but it's a worry that, and the disappointing thing is because the team are working so hard, they're so honest, they have huge character, that um, they just need to fix this and get better. And look, if you're cut open by a better team, you accept it. But I think some of the scores we, we have conceded in against Argentina, the, the Italian ones, and the other day. They're not dissimilar. That's the issue. If it was, if yeah, they were it's all in the wider channel. So, Ger, one pass has taken out four or five players at times. And the way Scotland played against England, you could see that they had clearly identified that kink in the English defence. The Finn Russell pass for a couple of those tries, um, the second Scottish try in particular. That's risk-reward scenario there from, from him, to be fair, and they'll do that. So they'll come to Dublin, people thinking, well, you know, Ireland are a better team, they'll win, the home soil, all that stuff. So that kind of forced you to go, let's play, let's yeah. go after it, let's chase it. And then one of these passes comes off like it did Saturday. Suddenly you have a huge sense of confidence, self-belief, and say, well, we can do this. The opposition then it has a negative effect in their mind. So. It's a concern and something that that just needs to be worked on in spacing and stuff. You can it can be fixed. Jared Payne was always a, he was brilliant in that thirteen channel because yeah. he was a real communicator under pressure and and you have dominant figures. We hear when I played, you hear about um, um, defence captains. So Drico, Dars, they were brilliant at because they were there so long at, at barking at the forwards to get inside, to get outside, to realign to shift inside, to get the faster guys out in the outer channels, all that kind of stuff. So in you fairness, just need more. The, the talk after the game was that Chris Farrell was really good at that as well, that actually he, he was loud, somebody went, oh yeah, he was at least as good, if not better than Robbie, which is interesting enough uh, as it is, but you know, for his first full Six Nations game to be as, as vocal as he was, and he seems to be that kind of character anyway, so um, clearly somebody who has a, a long future in but also, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, he was brilliant, and I think you need to get a, a variety between that line speed and sometimes just having to sit back and concede a few yards. Yeah. So it's great having the mentality to take away the, 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 that space and that gain line and win the gain line. But if you do that too hard on the inside, and there's a couple of these loop passes or passes in behind players where they're really deep and they can get that width Suddenly you've lost it's hard, years. so yeah. it's just a spacing thing and maybe sometimes going a little bit softer when you're under pressure. How did you uh, find that cohesion between Aki and Farrell at the weekend? Um, good, it's not, I wouldn't blame them because there's so many other guys, you're in different positions. Sometimes when there's a kick chase or kick retreat, you're running straight back and you don't have time to switch in. In an ideal situation, you want the faster guys on the outside off phase play and the forwards maybe in around the 10, 12 channel. Um, the tighter areas, you want forwards and you want backs on the outside. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, and if you're down numbers, if someone makes a line break, it's very hard to readjust and sprint all the way back and have a and perfect then, defense. Because yeah. you can't get off the line then because you're retreating. Um, there's a great story of um, when Mike Ford came into Ireland around 2000 um, and all this defensive stuff and this terminology was new to us. It was like pillar at the side of the rock, post was the next guy and pivot was the guy on the first receiver. And the idea going to Twickenham play in England in 2000 was to push him to the outside a little bit, be really strong on the inside, push him towards the touchline and then attack him there. I give him a little soft shoulder if you like on the outside and number up there and attack the rock. And that we worked on that all week and um, there was huge emphasis and this was new terminology. And I remember, um, I, I didn't start the game, but I was part of the extended squad. And I remember being in the tunnel area as the team were coming out and Mike Ford was on about the defence and I remember this and that. And Peter Classy come, came out the door and he said, well, look, it was called turf wedge. So turf was forward and wedge was push out, but staying connected to the guys inside and outside. And uh, Peter Clough, I can't say the, 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 the exactly what he said, but he said, um, if you're unsure about that turf wedge, that effing turf wedge, just come up and in. And Mike Ford just put his hand over his face and went, oh my God, I think we were beating 46-6 against England. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, <laughs> Claude just kind of threw the plan out the window that everyone was trying to work on and created confusion. And that's what defence is, yeah. and scatter defence is confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk, talk about some of the good stuff. Um, so Chris Farrell speaking with Oshin after the game. Have a look. 
Chris, Joe said during the week that he'd been talking to you for a couple of years. What kind of things has he been saying to you all the way along? What kind of tips has he been giving you? Yeah, um, probably uh, for about three years that I've been in France, I've been talking to Joe a little bit. I've always had a few phone calls from him. I've had a few uh, messages with clips, timings of clips from matches that I've been watching. I said, you could have done this better, you could have done this better defensively, you could have done this. Um, uh, he's just given me a little bit of advice on, on how to play the game and a few things that he's seen and the knowledge that he has and the very small details is what he prides himself on, he prides this team on and those kind of things is what's benefited me from, from, from dealing with Joe. And when he first got in contact, how big a boost was it for you? Because sometimes when a player goes away from home, that can be that and they disappear, we don't see them again. Yeah, look, initially... I'd spoke to him before I even played a game in France, so I was just like, look, he obviously he just wants Irish players back in Ireland. It's nothing, you know. I hadn't played a game, so I hadn't impressed him in any way. So, uh, yeah, and and then I got to play some games and played well. And year two, got to playing better, and he's still shopping to me, and it just strived me on, kept my goals lifted, lifted, lifting. All my all I wanted to do was pretty much come back and and play rugby in Ireland. So. He definitely helped her. Firstly and foremostly, that's that was what I was doing. I was coming back to play for Munster, and Munster, the, the, like the team that it is and the history that they have, was such an honour to me. And obviously, what's coming in the back of that is such a bonus. And finally, for me, um, you were filling in for Robbie Henshaw today. That's not an easy thing to do. Did Robbie chat to you about what you know is expected in that position? Did you chat to Joe about that? How did it all work? No, I don't think it needs to be said. What's expected when you wear a 13 jersey with Ireland because of who's been there before and what they've done between Gary, Robbie <coughs> and Brian Driscoll before that. Look, they've all been unbelievable and there's a certain expectation there and I know it because I've watched them for the last six, seven, ten years, whatever it's been. Um, and they've all done amazing things there and there is a pressure without a doubt. But for me, it's, it was almost like going back to the Fiji game that I played in November, just trying to fit in and whatever else comes with that is a bonus again. Yeah, not the greatest move Ulster ever made, letting him go, is it? I mean, what the hell were they thinking? No, it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to kind of, when they're younger guys, to, to be 100% sure, but he's been a great find Even for Even getting Munster. him back, like... Oh, yeah, on. yeah. I don't Sorry think he wants that. to go back because of... Getting the, everybody wanted him. Saris were trying to sign him, Bordeaux were trying to sign him. Um, a lot of top clubs were trying to get hold of him, and um, you often hear Bernard Jackman and Mike Prendergast who were his coaches in Grenoble talking about the quality. Yeah. And I, I would speak to Prendy in the last couple of years before he came back saying, this guy is just an unbelievable player. He has so much ability, so great hands, great physicality. Um, and he's our go-to man to get the ball in his hands. And he can put massive, great passes and get his width. So... Um, like you think, again, we, we always talk about the step up to international stuff and the step up to our biggest game since the last World Cup must have been huge for him. So we're not seeing anything like, yes, the full range of his talents. He hasn't fully become comfortable playing in international rugby yet. That's despite the fact he was brilliant. So there's still much more to come. Yeah, so he's not throwing any of those big wide passes because it's not kind of programmed uh, in, in the system, um, the way we play. Um, that's not to say that he won't do that if there's opportunities, but I just thought his, all, his whole application was superb. Um, made a mistake at one stage, um, got up a little bit too quick in the defensive line, half penny gets the ball outside him and I just thought his scramble defence was fantastic. Late on in the game, Scott Williams, it looks like Wales are going to counter attack. It's one on one with an awful lot of space and Scott Williams is deceptive. Farrell just doesn't give him that, he just doesn't shoot, up, shoot across too quickly to give him the opportunity to, to step inside him. He nearly shows him the outside. just knocks him down and was so unlucky for the turnover as well. Made some great carries in, into heavy traffic. Just some great carries just before the Bundyaki try. He goes through the, yeah. the, the Wales Always front makes draw, like nearly gets yards, in line. Just enough and to and get. that's the thing for a big man, he's six foot four, 17 stone, have that little bit of deception. And then if he has to run at a guy, he ran it bigger at one stage in that first half and got five, six yards. That is massive for your recycling ability for the forwards of guys coming on. And then Murray's just sweeping the ball away. Is it an injustice to Farrell to say that Schmidt made pretty significant tweaks to his game plan to make sure that Farrell wasn't going to get caught out in this game? Obviously, it worked a treat. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I think, look, first and foremost, when you have a guy coming in, and, and any player, it's kind of like making your debut. You want to do the simple things well. It'll, he'll, be, he'll develop and get his own confidence and um, you know, try, and, try and develop his game more. Um, so I think do the simple things well and that probably has been the message um, he probably felt that pressure 
you know, starting in a Six Nations game, playing in a 13th slot. But he's a very relaxed guy. He's, I think he believes in himself a lot. Um, and I think the benefit of being in the, the Irish system since, since the start of the year, training with the group, November would have benefited him massively. And he played with full of confidence the other day. So Wales are a good defensive side and they're very, very, very quick. Sean Edwards is very shrewd. They target the ball a lot. Um, we saw a couple of times guys carrying in the ball stripped out of contact. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll see some more variety because I think he offers more than just... Mm putting the head down. Yeah, a bit more variety. Like we, It seems weird to be in any way critical of the team that puts up 37 points, but it was far too close considering we dominated possession, we dominated territory. Like We allowed Wales back into that game in a way that the clinical side, the best clinical sides, the All Blacks, would never do. Yeah, really kind of uh, <laughs> concern me is we're 13-5 down after 15 or 20 minutes when we, we dominated so many It looked like we could have we, we killed them. Yeah, we could have. Johnny missed a couple of kicks. We, we could have scored from... When it, the, when another, pen, another penalty we got under the post um, and then they go up the field they get a penalty and then Garrett Davies one attack yeah. and uh, we concede which is and that was a soft score as well particularly around the fringes um, Whose fault was that? Uh, it was our collective fault I yeah. think again because I think there was a missed tackle on Aaron Shingler so he's running close to the ruck um, I think I don't want to name names because I'm not 100% sure, but that fringe defence was soft. And he put it, he was, he's a brilliant carrier shingler. He gets a gain line, and it's so crucial in those tight spaces to get a gain line. Suddenly, Rob Evans comes around as well, picks and goes, and, and you're in behind the Irish defence, and then it's scramble situation. Uh, Bundy Aki was lucky because if that try oh, yeah. wasn't given, it was a yellow card for him. It probably should have been a yellow card anyway, right? Like, it's still a yellow card offence. Why doesn't he get yellow carded? And there was there was one we scored a try when there was definitely there was three penalties. Yeah, and I thought like, Samson Lee came in from the side of a mall when we're going forward. So yeah, you could argue that that one from Bundy Aki, is he going to grab the tackle? They didn't show it enough in the replays to have a, a you know. Speaking of the replays, who put the replay of Rob Kearney kicking the ball out of the when he's on there? Who did that? <laughs> they don't do that in France. They don't do it in Twickenham. They don't do it in any sport in the world. The whole point of home advantage is you control the big screen and you go. Well, we'll show that after the next play. Yeah, because it was a big screen rather than a TMO spotting it, wasn't it? Totally so, big screen. Yeah. Anyway. It was, yeah, it goes back, yeah. I, uh, I, if I was Joe Schmidt, <laughs> I would be controlling the controllables. Doing, yeah. If like, you were doing the videos, you wouldn't be showing that. No. Get the scrum over with quick. Yeah, and exactly, play yeah. After. And afterwards, like, oh, look, look what you missed, ref. It was a correct call as well. I though. mean, it was a correct yeah, call. That's yeah. the whole point. You don't be... Uh, You'll be giving your advantage away. Good losers, England, of course. You know, the fight was Scotland's fault. The referee did them. Um, nothing to do with their back row being uh, three second rows, effectively. Their play team effectively playing five second rows at this point, or the six and a half, Chris Robshaw, as he was. Also, Mike Brown. Oh, you guys are giving that out Mike Brown. Well, I'm sorry, Eddie, but you whipped him off after two mistakes. So, screw you, Eddie Jones, is the short, my short summation. <laughs> he did an interview afterwards with Martin Gillingham from ITV, and. Um he, he's practically attacking the interviewer, uh, which again... Good man, Eddie. Let's take it. True take colours. your beating. Um, stand there. Be kind. Be nice. Be humble. And unfortunately, he you wasn't. fake those things. Uh, behind the, the kind of narkiness that you see, he's actually a nice bloke. Genuinely, I've met him a few times. Uh, but he has this complex issue. He, he's a bit of a, you know how dare you beat us type scenario and I think that's the kind of approach he had with, with Martin after the game and it was disappointing and he kind of stares him down right after the interview as he's walking away. The issues for England are, have they, and this is the question that, that maybe has to be thrown out there, have they peaked? Um, are they as good as we think they are? They're a better side than they showed on Saturday and that's rugby for you because sometimes if you don't turn up, you don't get it right. The opposition are there's this incredible surge of of, of urgency and aggression from you them. Think it's about hard. The, think about the Twickenham game against Wales, where a bounce of the ball goes their way, and they're ah, oh, this is great, life is really easy for us. Um, but they don't score for 60 minutes against a Welsh side who it turns out you can score against, and that's them at home in their pomp with full of the piss and vinegar of a two try early lead. And like I don't know. Like, I'm glad that we've seen this now, England under a bit of pressure, having to defend and 
being tackled properly? Because it did seem like for a couple of seasons it was like, oh, geez, England are great again. They have issues in certain areas. The back row, there's no balance to the back row whatsoever. Um, Underhill is sitting on the bench. He's, he's, he should be playing seven. Rob Shaw's a six. Um, he criticised him before he took over himself after the World Cup, saying that he wasn't a seven. He's now playing him as a seven. With all the depth in English rugby, I, I'm, I just can't believe that you know they can't get a proper balanced back row. Vunapolo is a massive loss to him because he was a real focal point for the way Jones wanted to play. But playing Courtney Laws at six, and I'm a fan of Courtney Laws. He's he's an incredibly abrasive, good player. He's a second, second row. row. Toje is a second row. Launchbury is a second row. So yeah, you've the best second row in the world. Two doesn't go. So pick two of them, put one of them on the bench. That's just the reality. We pick proper back rows, there's enough of them in, in the UK. Um, Simmons is a great player, he got injured, um, but you think that balance in the back row is not right. And they were completely dominated by Watson, Wilson and uh, Barkley. Barkley was outstanding mm -hmm. and Watson. Yeah. And then Stuart McAnally, he's a converted back row as a hooker, he's getting turnovers as well. So like it, though, as well. it doesn't matter who you are, if the All Blacks turn up and, you, and they're not winning their breakdown, they're in trouble. So that's what happened England on Saturday. Good stuff, Alan. We'll let you go because I know you've got to do an L um, <laughs> spin on the radio. <laughs> uh, Andrew Porter was also in great form, speaking with Ushian afterwards. Have a look. Talk us through that game because it looked crazy from the sideline. I can only imagine what it was like on the pitch. Yeah, it was a very physical game. I think we knew that was coming from the Welsh, but uh, yeah, I think it's great that we could get the win, especially with a bonus point. Talk to us about your own game because obviously you were replacing Ty Furlong who's one of the best in the world but um, your coach seems happy with you, I think all the analysts and pundits seem happy with you but what was it like out there for you? Yeah obviously quite big boost to fill with uh, coming in for Ty Furlong but uh, yeah like the coaches and players really uh, helped me up my confidence throughout the, the last few weeks but um, yeah like I thought, thought it went alright so um, yeah i would look to build on that hopefully for the next game. What were those first couple of scrums like was there nerves or how did you handle it uh, there was a few nerves yeah but I think uh, tried to get myself in the best position I could so and then with Bessie helping me out so I mean the uh, the talent we have come like in our second rows and back rows yeah I think it was a, a pack effort I think and do you feel vindicated now for switching sides of the scrum I'm sure when that switch was made or when it was put to you maybe you doubt but it seems to be working out quite well uh, yeah like a lot of doubts at the very beginning but I think uh, it's, it's coming a bit clearer now I think so yeah happy with that